Right, a very warm welcome, everybody. Uh, great to see some uh, some good numbers on uh, on yet another Wednesday webinar. Uh, this week around, um, we're going to be talking uh, with Duncan Baker Brown about the circular economy, uh, and and particularly um, Duncan's going to be running us through some concepts, ideas, case studies that demonstrate how closed loop circular systems can change the way we design, build, inhabit, maintain and deconstruct our built environment. It's something which uh, increasingly we need to know more about when we're talking about holistic building design, um, but I'm gonna let Duncan uh, fully introduce himself uh, and the topic in a short moment. Um, <clears throat> the usual, just running through a very quick bit of admin, um, You'll be more than bored of this, but I'll, I'll do it anyway for the sake of it. Uh, keep your mics on mute, um, just so that we can get the most out of the experience and, and the speaker. Uh, do ask your questions in the chat box. We're going to leave the question to the end, but if you think of a question, bang it up there halfway through the chat and I'll run through those and filter those and Duncan will try and rattle through as many of those as he can do at the end for you. And a reminder that we are recording uh, the webinar. Um, we are uh, going to stop putting these on, on YouTube to start with. We're going to put these within the, the uh, Meshwork webinar. So uh, if you want to watch these afterwards, check this out on the uh, uh, on the actual platform it's, uh, it, itself uh, and do encourage others to uh, to take a look at those as well. As you'd be well aware, Meshwork is um, completely free. We're trying to ramp up the content. Uh, as I was saying to uh, Duncan earlier, increasingly we're going to do more webinars during the, uh, during the week. When they're not just going to be on Wednesdays, so check that out. We're going to invite more speakers to talk about uh, more meaningful, sustainable built environment content. Tell your friends, let's get as many people as we can do on the platform. We're now over 600 people on the platform and it is growing rapidly. And just a few uh, quick moments on Mesh Energy. If, you're if you haven't been on these webinars before, uh, Mesh Energy is an independent and holistic energy consultancy practice. Uh, so whether it's your first or your 50th uh, low energy design project, uh, we are here to help you through uh, whichever stage uh, you, you know, you need experience uh, and, and low energy sustainability advice to try and bring your, uh, your, your client's latest project to fruition and try and make it as painless as possible. Uh, cover projects across the UK, Europe and beyond. Um, that's it from me. I am going to uh, now again introduce uh, Duncan, um, who's going to share with us his, uh, his presentation. Duncan has for a long, long time, uh, been been an advocate of the circular economy, uh, and I just looked up your book, Duncan, and the Reuse Atlas. If you haven't, I'm going to pitch Duncan's book on his behalf at, at the start. So Duncan wrote a book three, four years ago now called the Reuse Atlas, uh, and uh, you know has been been talking about, as I say, the circular economy for a long, long time. Um, but enough of me, Duncan. I'm going to hand it over to you. So if you want to share your uh, thanks, Doug, and then you can you can go. Brilliant. You can, see, can you see my screen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, guys. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just uh, yeah get rid of a couple of things on the screen. Whoops. Anyway, good morning. Yeah, my name is Duncan Baker Brown. Um, I'm a practicing architect as well as an academic. I'm a principal lecturer at University of Brighton as well. Uh, a day or so a week with that. I said day or so. It's meant to be a day, but since lockdown. It's become a bit more because we do everything like I'm doing now uh, via team still for the next year. I'm doing all my teaching like this, which is a little bit disappointing and time consuming. So I'm also uh, an author. Yeah, as I said, the Reuse Atlas subtitled A Designer's Guide Towards a Circular Economy. And I've practiced in the world of sustainability for nearly 30 years. Um, and sometimes I say that's why you haven't heard from me or heard of me because uh, I've been in that in that world. But if now there's a a bright light shining on all of us that are in that world. So it, it's it's amazing transformative times for us. And with that in mind, obviously, you know, the, the pandemic, which I, I titled my lecture actually Design in the Age of Emergency and then bra open brackets S, close brackets. I think it's one great big emergency, to be honest. I think uh, planet Earth is uh, um, suffering because of the way we go about our lives. And I think the COVID pandemic is all part of that. But it, the pandemic is really asking uh, questions of the way we occupy the built environment. And I think there's a, a lot of work in 
transforming the built environment that is that to be fit for purpose, climate resilient and low carbon. Um, some good news though, I mean, remember before COVID, 2019 was the year that 90% of UK local authority regions committed to being net zero carbon by 2030. So that's 60 million citizens living in these regions and around the world, nearly a billion people living in regions that have declared a climate and ecological emergency. So the doors there uh, ajar to be pushed open, in my opinion. But what do we do next? Well, uh, yeah, I was at a, I was at a, uh, the NEC yesterday, UK Construction Week, and still it's, can we afford to be sustainable? I mean, can we afford not to is really the bigger, better question, but yeah, we're working out if we can afford to save ourselves, really. Uh, and then you go, oh, good Boris telling everybody to grow up, uh, bad Boris is saying build, build, build. I mean, we, we've, it's it's not as simple as that. We, we need um, more intelligence right at the top, in my opinion. Um, and I would argue, I mean, are we all climate emergency deniers, actually? Um, uh, you know, we, everyone, with, not many people would put up their hand in a room if I said, uh, are you a climate emergency denier? But I think a lot of people just sort of think about it and think, geez, and then get on with their lives. Uh, two questions though, what are the real challenges to adopting an authentic sustainable existence with our host planet? And why aren't more people with power concerned with their own business as usual policies? And I say that within the context of COP26 being a mere few weeks away, and uh, there isn't a world leader that's gonna arrive um, and land in Glasgow without singed hair or wet, you know, wet feet. Everybody's had floods and fires in the last, 12 months so it's not just uh, southern hemisphere countries uh, feeling uh feeling the pressure as it were it's everybody so maybe things are about to change uh but maybe we just can't give up our love for fossil fuels so why should we care well there's no vaccine for the climate and ecological emergency it's not going away uh three years ago we were told we got 10 years to sort it out well we don't have 10 years to sort it out anymore uh, so why us in the construction sector? Well, we consume 50% of all the world's mined and harvested raw materials annually, and it's the environmental destruction associated with this process that is one of the main factors in generating the current mass extinction of species. 2010, uh, that figure of mined and extracted materials was between 45 and 60 billion tonnes. It's now about 100 billion tonnes a year. So the, con the construction sector consumes uh, five, 50 billion tonnes of stuff annually. In the UK, we consume 600 million tonnes of products a year that generates about 200 million tonnes of waste. And 60% of that is from the construction sector. That's 120 million tonnes of stuff going to landfill and incineration annually. And we're, the built environment uh, creates about 45% of the CO2 emissions in this country and around the world, basically. So my point of view is that construction sector is half the planet's problem. Humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources. So it's all about that, managing resources, and it's designers and constructors who do this. We specify what our buildings and the uh, systems that, and uh, uh, that go into our buildings are made of what they and what they are. So we need to take uh, more responsibility of these things that we specify and really think about where they come from and where they end up. And at the moment, it's a linear system. So we exist as a linear economy. We mine natural resources, we process them into things, and we use them for moments and throw them away. We're the only system on planet Earth that uh, works like this. In effect, we rock up at a place, we rape and pillage it, we, we squeeze the last ounce of nutrients out of it, create a desert and move on. And that's what's happened in California. People, there's a mass exodus up now from California because it's on fire, there's no water. So, you know, that, that place has been transformed by humans and obviously historically it's happened again and again we've got to get away from that way of doing so the opportunities well the obvious one is the circular economy to turn those linear systems into circ back on themselves into circular systems and in effect emulate the way the rest of the natural planet works in the natural world there's no waste waste or what you might call waste from one system is a resource for another system or an ecosystem and in the sort of human version of a circular economy you've got two circles you've got the organic biosphere and you've got the tech sphere and in the biosphere it, it 
it's quite straightforward. You, uh, you know, organic things are grown, then harvested, made into things, used, reused, reused. And if we don't add toxins to them, they can become compost to grow more things. So a nice little uh, circle there. The tech sphere is more challenging, and it's uh, definitely where at the moment humans are just mining val valuable stuff, minerals, uh, uh, rare metals, etc. Uh, and turning them into highly sophisticated things that are used for literally moments, you know, a number of months, and then they are thrown away. And what we've got to do with the tech sphere is design, the, design things to be material, store, uh, material stores for the future. So, for example, in a circular economy, a BMW, an old BMW, is the source material for new BMWs. And BMWs should be designed in a way to be deconstructed uh, so that uh, it's easy to do. So we're not just talking about recycling. What you want to do in a circular economy is keep the materials and the products at their level of sophistication. So there's no point grinding down uh, a BMW into rubber, plastic and assorted metals. What you want to do is to be able to literally unbolt a BMW, polish it up and bolt it back together again and there's your new BMW. So obviously uh, this is the book that uh, uh, was the mo most popularized, mo popularized the concept of the circular economy. It actually, um, the, the idea was first written about by Professor Walter Stahl uh, in about 1974. He, he pr proposed a paper uh, for a service economy and the idea of a, 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 a circular economy was uh, born then. But um, definitely Michael Braungart and Bill McDonough in their Cradle to Cradle, Reinventing the Way We Make Things book uh, is where it became popular, uh, most popular. And they talk about doing good, not less bad. And that's a bit of a pop at sustainability, actually, because uh, we, in the world of sustainable design, we would say, let, let's reduce carbon emissions or operational energy by 10% or 20% or let's use a little less gas, a little less coal. But actually, we shouldn't be using that those fossil fuels in the first place. So it's not about doing less bad, it's about reinventing the way we do things and just doing good in, as far as the planet is concerned. So some good news. Well, the national grid's cleaning up, you know, uh, e even without a lot of investment from the UK so far, it's about to get loads apparently. Uh, but, you know, these are just little uh, snippets from uh, uh, Twitter or wherever over the last year or so. So, you know, at one point today, 69% of electricity in UK, the UK was uh, wind and solar power. You know, BP are thinking of or are divesting from some of their investments from fossil fuels into renewables. Things are changing, but not as quickly as they need to. People are writing about, you know, a case for never demolishing another building. The whole idea of being resource efficient, the best way of doing it is to not smash up the stuff already built, but to nurture it and uh, transform it. Um, you know, there are campaigns for 0% VAT on uh, retrofit. The whole point being that at the moment, if you've got 300 pounds or 300 million pounds to spend on residential property uh, to retrofit it, to uh, you know, reduce its carbon footprint, uh, you'll be paying VAT at 20%. If you knock down that building, and do a new build project, yeah, well, it's 0% um, VAT. It's like, you know, and obviously that's to encourage uh, Tory donors um, among other things. But um, anyway, moving on. So the other point is that over 80% of today's built environment will be with us in 2050. And it's the existing building in, in built environment that has to perform to net zero, these net zero targets. Um, we're in a world now where these, these people get the, best, the biggest prize in, in the world for architecture, the Prichter Prize, uh, Lakatan and Vassal. I'll show you one of their projects in a minute, but they do have this sort of strap line, never demolish, never replace. So we are in a different place. And we're in a place also where these people irritate the hell out of most other people, but they're talking about insulating and uh, the built environment. So the built environment is getting very, very, the construction industry, you might even say, is getting very political at the moment, um, being politicised. You know, we do need to make our built environment climate resilient. It needs to be low carbon, climate resilient and, and healthy, um, habitable spaces. And we don't have that at the moment. There's another article on um, the need to stop demolishing. It's everywhere at the moment. So I would profit is a bit radical, but I think it's the truth. 
close down conventional mines. We don't need to mine for stuff anymore. We've mined enough stuff. It's above ground now. There's more copper above ground than below ground, apparently. And you know this is this is an open cast mine in Chile. Uh, it's a copper mine. Uh, mines are not nice places for people, and they are the, one of the main things that are destroying uh, the natural environment. We don't need them anymore. So what I'm saying is, mine the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene being the current geological epoch that we're in, the human-made layer of stuff, geological layer that wraps planet Earth, whether it's um, plastic in our oceans, landfill sites, the, the, the furniture you're sitting on, the building you're in, uh, you know, it, the, the detritus of our existence, all this stuff, a, a process stuff that's above ground, we've got to rework that. Now, if we do that, not only are, is this a sort of more of a circular way of doing things, it's what the rest of the natural world would do. If it had, you know, once, a, once a, the natural world has, uh, build something, it will nurture it uh, rather than just uh, pull it over and build another thing. It might make more work for yourself. But the point is we're, we're reducing the stress on the natural world to pr provide resources for us. So we mine the Anthropocene and nurture natural resources. That's the strategy. And I would say that we actually know what to do. There's a collective knowledge out there, and that's why uh, getting together like the, uh, like this this morning is what we have to do much more of because there's collected knowledge in the audience. We know what to do. Um, some people already have a plan. Amsterdam is a donut city. That's a reference to Kate Raworth's donut economics. Um, so the donut idea is that the inner ring of the donut is uh, the um, boundary for uh, social value. So anything that goes inside that boundary is where people are uh, being uh, you know, put under pressure, persecuted, or whatever, and then the outer ring is the uh, the, um, the limits for uh, the natural world. So you stay within those two rings, and you're doing the right thing. Uh, Helsinki has been uh, has a carbon neutral plan; has had it for three or four years. Um, London now has its uh, endorsed uh, um, London plan, which includes a circular economy route map for the uh, built environment and a couple of other sectors as well, including food. And Brighton Hove um, uh, City also has a circular economy route map for the construction sector that's gonna be published very soon now. And I've, I was uh, part of the team that wrote that. The RIBA has a 2030 climate challenge, which is um, uh, yeah, quite, quite, quite something, but it's referring to the Letty Climate Emergency Design Guide, the uh, London Energy Transformation initiative which is a brilliant guide it involved the original one the climate emergency design guide involved over a thousand people um, in its uh, original draft and it's what what was inspiring for me when i first saw it is it had the buy-in from all different agencies it wasn't just um just architects or just uh, services engineers working on it it was across industry and, and we got these other studies that are less well known but they are all cross industry uh, studies looking at how the industry can become more climate literate, how we understand what the challenges are, and then are clear about what the solutions are. And the one on the left is the industry one, the one on the right is for education. So back to a circular economy. Um, I wrote a book, uh, which uh, Doug kindly referred to at the beginning of the talk. I'm doing the new one at the moment. And um, it was Basically, what I was wanting to do is to prove to people that uh, the idea of the circular economies is out there and there are delivered projects out there. And um, the, the idea with, for the book was that it took you on uh, four steps towards closed loop uh, circular systems. And the first step is the most basic thing to do from right through to the last step, which is the real McCoy, the circular economy. And so I started with recycling projects and recycling is okay, but it involves uh, taking sophisticated things and grinding them down, melting them or shredding them into less sophisticated resources that then have to be reprocessed into things again. So to do all of that, you're creating uh, waste, you're consuming energy. So it's okay because it can divert a waste stream, for example, from landfill incineration. It can add, add value to so-called waste, turning waste into resource, so that's good. But it's a lot better to reuse, and most of my lecture today is going to focus on this 
idea of reuse because that refers to the built environment that we've got which needs to become climate resilient now reuse and reduce can be very similar things but uh, reduce is where you really need designers to be thinking cleverly and uh, laterally often often because you, know, you you might be saying i'm not going to use any resources and i'm going to transform this this thing or this place that's very clear that that really needs some thought and then the last uh ones that case studies that I uh, put in the book were genuine circular economy projects, which uh, which even this book was published in 2017. And there were a number of great examples then. And I'm doing the second edition because there are so many good examples now. So with the, uh, with recycling and reuse in mind, uh, a phrase or a, a, ter a term that's come out of the circular economy is the idea of urban mining, searching for new material sources to reduce the need for natural raw materials. And considering our cities as material stores for the future. And I'm deliberately, this is Brighton, and this is a conservation area in Brighton. I'm talking about the photograph. And um, I deliberately show that because I'm not asking for the whole, whole wholesale uh, deconstruction of everything you can see in there. And I think it's quite interesting that a sort of strategy for retrofitting what you can see there, which is the original uh, early 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, um, Norfolk Terrace uh, in the foreground, and then you've got uh, 1960s buildings on the top left, there'd be a different approach to these different parts of the city. Um, with that in mind, the idea of urban mining, I, I, I did this project in 2014, and I won't dwell on it too much, it's a lecture on its own, but um, basically when we looked at the idea of doing this property, which is called the Brighton Waste House by the Guardian newspaper, it's actually a two-story teaching facility at the University of Brighton. We wanted to prove that um, at the time for every five houses, uh, being built in the UK, one house worth of waste went to landfill incineration. So construction sites were 20% inefficient. Um, so I wanted to prove that you could construct um, a building to passive power standards just using waste material thrown away by others. And we did that um, with this um, Brighton Waste House. 90% of what you're looking at there is material thrown away by others. Um, we tried to quantify uh, what it was then. It was about 55 tonnes of material that was diverted from landfill and incineration. Um, and it attracted uh, other research projects. So this is an interreg funding we got for a project, which were, which the main idea for the project was uh, to locate material, uh, sorry, waste flows, and to um, turn those waste sources, resources into construction materials. Um, so we, this is a resource map that we did. This is a, we worked with um, a colleague who's got a, um, this interactive uh, GIS map. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, he called, goes by, uh, the company's called uh, Community 21. And we located these um, unusual uh, waste stream, which was oyster shells. So really, really nearby the waste house is English's oyster bar, and it throws away 50,000 oyster shells a year. So this is a this is a bit of recycling. So we found someone um, collected these shells, and if we if you burn them at 900 degrees, you get quicklime, and if you uh, you can add other aggregates. There was a lot of um, uh, construction work going on uh, in Brighton at the moment. There has been for the last few years, and so there was a lot, obviously a lot of construction spoil. So we could add that as aggregates to the oyster shells. And we played around with all sorts of different materials. You can see in the uh, background there, there are duvets, because we also collected duvets, because we, we were working with the Olia, and they, uh, we said to them, what's your most pain in the neck textile uh, material that gets thrown away? And they said, immediately bedding. It's, it's cheaper to buy a new duvet uh, if you're a student uh, in Brighton than it is to get one cleaned. And the point I refer to students there, because we've got two universities in Brighton, loads of hotels, a tourist in industry, you can imagine the amount of duvets that are thrown away. So we're looking at duvets as insulation and then other source material to make the uh, make tiles for external wall tiles. And um, there's Ben Bosons from local uh, work studio. And he's the guy that burnt the oyster shells for us to create quick lime. Uh, you basically, the, uh, add aggregates to that quick line, like I said. But with the sh with the tile that he's actually holding there, the white tile, that is 100% oyster shells. So the aggregate there are the oyster shells as well. And uh, so you've got concrete tiles. And so 
uh, the waste house was clad on the outside with um, uh, carpet tiles, uh, which by the way, are still performing really well. And uh, we removed some of those and uh, opened up a, a panel in a wall panel in the, the waste house and uh, uh, inserted some duvets for insulation and then uh, finished them on the outside with a rain screen of these lovely concrete tiles. And these tiles, by the way, while they're curing, they're absorbing carbon. I'm not really a big fan of the sort of carbon offsetting idea um, because uh, I just think our atmosphere's got enough carbon in it. We shouldn't be uh, uh, putting any more in it. But um, it's an interesting exercise to see, you know, a, a waste flow can be turned into these beautiful tiles. Um, and uh, we've got clients who are picking up on this idea. So this is a project, a bit of a, the image on the right is a bit of a project in Walthamstow in London that we're working on at the moment. And the, this image on the left is a, um, uh, an image that my client sent me because uh, they had a couple of hundred cubic meters of waste spoil from this site in Walthamstow that they didn't want to throw away. And um, so what they did is they, um, they made these, uh, made the, using the spoil, they, they, they hand through these bricks and they're not fired, they're air dried. So they can't be load bearing, they'll be used for internal petitions. But our clients done this because those bricks will be in the, the next project they do. So instead of paying for that spoil to re be removed from site, they've um, turned it into a resource for the next project. This is another um, research project which I'm working on at the moment, which has got the natty title facilitating the circulation of reclaimed building elements in Northwestern Europe. So this is this project is actually looking at the ability of the construction sector to deconstruct buildings and then put that second hand material into the supply chain. So we're putting together a directory of 1500 suppliers who are dealing with just that. And it's led by an organization called Rota DC, Rota Deconstruction, who are based in Brussels. And I'll talk about their work in a second. But already online are these resources. So a guide for identifying the reuse potential of construction products. You know, it's quite straightforward, but you know, it's, it's, the, it, it's, it's a bit dull at one level, but it's actually the stuff that we need to understand how to not throw material away. A guide, you know, the second thing is a guide for facilitating the integration of reclaimed building materials in large scale projects. There you go. So our, our role, my role as, um, as principal lecturer at University of Brighton was to uh, fac facilitate a summer school. And we did it this year, it was a digital summer school. And um, some of the, the, the photographs there are of the team leaders we had. So we had 11 teams with two team leaders each. And some of those people are uh, you know, from across the world, they're some of the best known people who are dealing with the circular economy in the construction sector. And we also had about uh, 80 students. Again, because it was digital event, we could have people from all over the world. So people from South America through to China. And it was really exciting. The event that we should have had in 2020 was gonna be based in Brighton. And I'm, I'll just mention it a bit because it shows you that they're, have what I think the door's waiting to be uh, pushed right open. It's ajar at the moment. Brighton Hope City Council were prepared to deconstruct a building that they had lined up for demolition for our summer school. So the idea was that this building would be deconstructed and then the elements of that building piled up in a playground of this empty school in the middle of Brighton. And then for two weeks, we would have students in teams reappraising that material. So that was the, what the original idea was gonna be. Then the, then the city were gonna put that secondhand material out into the supply chain to see how it, you know, how it would be dealt with by the construction sector. So I think that you know, there really is an opportunity here. Just so you can see what road to do, this is them uh, deconstructing um, a multi-story bank building in Brussels. So you view these images from top left to bottom right. They unpack buildings that would normally be pushed over. Uh, other people doing it in a different way. The Lendica Group, they, um, you know, I think most people in the construction sector know that 20th century brick buildings for after 1910 don't have lime mortar, they have cement mortar and the mortar is stronger than the bricks. So you don't get a crop of bricks if you, uh, demolish a uh, 20th century brick building, you get rubble, uh, not unless you uh, go to it with an angle grinder and then you can get brick panels. So the Lentica group had a new housing project to do in Denmark, in um, Copenhagen, and uh, they found four buildings uh, due for demolition and they cut them up with an angle grinder and there's a bit of the housing scheme. So that's got brick panels for, from four different buildings. 
and they allowed the builders to compose the panels however they wanted actually it was just uh, the constraint was uh, the, the supply chain of the four different brick types. Uh, this is slightly more low key, but I think really impactful. This is Cleveland Steel, who needed a new building uh, for their, um, you know, their steel build business. Uh, and they found one. They found an existing building in Dublin with a, a BIM model. So they thought, great, we've got the BIM model, but this building's only 10 years old. We'll know exactly what it, uh, what it is. Therefore, we can deconstruct it. And they had a go um, at deconstructing it. And this, these are uh, shots of it being erected in England. Um, and the BIM model wasn't quite right. It was a few things that they had to work on, a bit of extra structure they had to introduce. But the point was mucking about with an existing building, deconstructing it, putting it on a, on a boat, getting it over to England and re-erecting it in the UK, saved them nearly a million pounds on a five million pound project. So they're saving money by doing things a different way, by reusing. This is a recent project um, for British land by Len Lease, uh, number one Triton Square. And it was a, that building there has been, been there for about uh, 18 or 19 years. Um, what's interesting is one of the highest elements of our built environment sector that uh, in terms of uh, co consumption is, is obviously big buildings in financial districts around the world. When they're first when they're first constructed, they have these temporary interiors often to attract uh, potential uh, uh, tenants. And obviously, as soon as those tenants say, "Yeah, we'll have three floors of whatever," uh, they tear out that that uh, brand new interior and put their own mark on a uh, an identity on the building. So that's the first lot of stuff that's been thrown away. Then every sort of five to seven years, the interiors get made over even more often sometimes. And then these buildings, that when they're only about 20 years old, then they get demolished because you know, companies want to have uh, a bigger idea, you know, a brand new identity or an updated identity. So this is where a lot of the wasteful practice really happens. So for British land to say, we'll do it a different way is quite impactful. But the interesting thing is because these buildings are only 20 years old, the supply chain that uh, facilitated their build, them being built in the first place is pro probably still intact. So that's why in this case, they were able to deconstruct, carefully take off the original glass facade of this building, clean it up in a car park nearby, update the glazing uh, mullions to be uh, to contemporary standards and put the glazing back on. So you've got secondhand glazing, which the big deal with reusing is, is guarantees. How can you, you know, ensure that this material is fit for purpose and guaranteed? Well, you can because the original curtain wall supply is still around. So they were able to uh, give their secondhand product the guarantees that it needs. And I've listed there on the right all these other savings because they didn't demolish number one Triton Square, they refurbished it. I'll just talk to you. Um, I'm a practicing architect, but we also uh, do circular economy and sustainability consultancy to, for other design teams. And I'll just show you the sorts of things we do. So this is for a, a site for about 800 homes um, in the middle of uh, Lewis, near where I live. And uh, this is the sort of work we do. So we do, and we would start with projects, whether it's a big project like this or our own smaller projects, we look at what resource maps, we look at what resources are nearby. And in this case is the first bit of site analysis around night, uh, natural assets. But this is the actual site here highlighted in 3D. So there's a lot of light industrial buildings on the site, which would normally just be pushed over um, and so we identified the buildings that are sort of the yellowy gold color. These are ones that could be just reused. They didn't need to be uh, only, they could just be adapted, retrofitted. The gray ones could be deconstructed and be a material source for the new buildings, which is, you know, it's obviously housing and lots of other things going on there. And then the red ones were for recycling because they're in such a, a poor state. And then we looked at the ground condition so we were looking at what, uh, you know, that is all that ground there next to the river ooze, that is all tarmac, concrete, brick, stone, whatever. It's a resource of aggregates. And normally this would just be scraped away and thrown away and then new stuff imported. So we were quantifying the amount of material there could, that could be reused. 
And then this is a bit more difficult for you guys to see, but we were looking at sort of human networks that could ensure that um, we're working with local suppliers, uh, local industry, et cetera. Um, and a local supply chain in terms of materials. And these are materials that we're locating either on site or near site that could uh, supply the construction site. Um, when you're deconstructing buildings, uh, and you're doing it at a sort of at a city scale or a regional scale, you need the physical infrastructure to um, allow this to happen. And so there's this idea for a building that sort of exists already, but it's going to be defined as a re remanufacturing. And this is the building that would where you would drop off your, um, you know, your deconstructed buildings where the materials would be cleaned up uh, and where they would be uh, offered for sale. And uh, so this, you obviously have a digital platform that supports this as well. So it's a warehouse at one level, but because it's a new thing and we're looking at, a, you know, when you're talking about recycling and I'll show you in a minute, there are sort of so-called new materials, novel materials that are coming out of these, um, the situation. You need, there's a, there's a need for some R&D as well. So the, the first remanufactories that will happen around, uh, uh, that will be, uh, you know, around the UK and wherever uh, will in, involve uh, uh, the sort of uh, R&D labs as well. So this is a little study we did where we were looking at, uh, we did a survey of an existing industrial building on the site and I literally unpacked it to quantify the components of that building. And then we looked at the way we could reintroduce those components to an existing building on the site as well to in effect extend, it, extend the building upwards um, by using those components. Now, this is a project by Lacatan of Vassal in Paris, and these are the guys that won the Pricta Prize earlier this, this year. And um, this is one of my favorite projects because it's a, it's a retrofit project, but it's not just external wall insulation and solar panels. It's a clever bit of design. And this tower on the left was due for uh, demolition. It's a residential tower. And the mayor of Paris, had put, uh, mayor's office, had put aside 35 million euros to get this thing built. And Lacatan of Vassal went to the mayor of Paris and said, we can give you your new residential tower for two thirds the price that you've put aside. And uh, 10 years later, the, <laughs> they kept, got the mayor's office approached them because uh, they hadn't done the project. And they said, we'll take you up on your offer, but how are you going to do it? And this is how they would, were going to do it. They literally just took the facade off the building and, and it was just a concrete panel facade. And then they added a new winter garden facade. So this is a deep facade. It's two meters deep plus a balcony. So what you're getting is a sort of um, low tech, but um, highly adaptable, useful addition to the, uh, to, to the tower. So uh, this is a diagram obviously of one, one apartment. And um, if, if you can see my cursor on the left, that's the existing situation take off that panel, that's what this shows, and then bolt on this winter garden, which is uh, two layers of double glazed slide, full height sliding uh, doors with internal blinds to reduce glare in winter, uh, another series of blinds uh, for um, so to reduce overheating, and a balcony also to reduce overheating in summer. And you bolt that onto the existing flat, and the net result is this. So here it is being constructed. So you get your new, your, a new apartment block by plugging into the existing infrastructure. And that's the before and after shot. And they didn't, they didn't do any decorating to the internal apartments. Now the net result is that before you overheated, you had no, in, in the summer, you were freezing in the winter, you had such little natural light that you had to have lights on all the time. Uh, and, um, generally an unpleasant place to be. Afterwards, you've got all your, um, all your utility bills are reduced by about 40%. You've got uh, loads of natural ventilation, loads of natural light, an ability to control your environment. And uh, amazingly, you've got an extension to your property of 12 square meters plus a balcony. Uh, it's just win, win, win. And that's sort of clever design. These new winter gardens are unheated and they create a sort of environmental buffer zone that protects the internal flats and bottom line is they don't have to use so much energy to uh, heat, heat themselves or light themselves. 
And we've got a similar project that we're uh, doing in Brighton where we've got three existing towers and we're extending them, joining them, li linking them with community facilities at high level, uh, dealing with the ground plane as well. You can't really see it with the images, but with uh, ground planes, got new community cafes, et cetera, plus um, courtyard housing. But then we're doing that, we're dropping um, a new uh, winter garden facade over the existing apartments. So the existing ones get extensions and the new ones do a lot of work for that site in terms of reducing uh, the carbon footprint. So we're doubling the density of apartments on site. And it's because of the South Downs, it can't go south because of the uh, uh, English Channel and the East West, it can't move either. So it's sort of landlocked. So, um, you know, it's got a waiting list of 15,000 families on this housing list. So uh, we've got to find ways of densifying Brighton. But this is a case of densify, double the density and uh, reducing the carbon footprint by two thirds. So in a real world, how are we going to apply these strategies of material reuse and re radical reduction in the consumption of resources to the, your everyday projects. And one way we're going to do it is with, um, with big data and uh, quantifying the resource potentials and finding the digital tools and data databases that are currently emerging and being able to use them. So this is quite a historic photograph actually from about 2015. So this is a, one of the sort of paths in the world of the circular economy, super use. And they're based in the Netherlands and this is their harvest map. And it was an interactive map of the Netherlands, GIS uh, informed. And each one of those icons is a source of material. Um, and so you can click on that and find a pile of bricks, timber, whatever it was and, get, and go and get it. So this is a map that tells you where stuff is. Uh, this is their own sort of diagram of the map because uh, they would do resource maps of um, if they go, this is a project in Rotterdam. Uh, and so they did a resource map, which is a bit like the ones I'm just showing you, where they, they identify what's on site and what's nearby. And they found these materials lying around. Sometimes what they do, super use, is they find the material and then they think, what can we do with it? So this is wind tur uh, turbine blades, redundant ones. So they, with a geo, with a sort of uh, Google Maps, actually, they found a, f a wind turbine factory in nearby uh, in Rotterdam. And they found that... Um, there were some turbine blades in the courtyard in the, in the outside yard that hadn't hadn't been moved for ages and they went and asked the person that ran the factory what they were doing with it and he said they're they're damaged blades they're going to go to landfill um and so they said right we'll find a project for them and because these things are so big you could have, you know you can create playgrounds you can create buildings out of them they're massive uh this is another project redundant uh, light industrial units in an air um and on an airfield an airport uh, in the Netherlands. And um, instead of it being pushed over, this um, airfield's now been turned into uh, an industrial park. And with their, survey, with their resource mapping exercise, they found these windows being uh, pulled out of um, a multi-story building. There were a thousand of these windows being, being uh, taken out of uh, this residential apartment. And this is, you know, this is unattractive stuff, but this is the stuff that is actually clogging up um, our waste streams and going to landfill incineration. So UPVC windows. They actually, SuperUse actually found someone who was prepared to clean these windows up, revamp them, and then they reinstalled them into these into this building and they transformed this building, but using really unattractive stuff, but diverting a waste stream. Now, in terms of modeling and quantifying the resource potential of a place, there's a lot of people doing this. And one of the people, one of the consultants is an organization called Metabolic. Again, they're in the Netherlands and they're looking at resource flows into cities. So they're looking at energy, water, food, the lot, and they would track these flows and identify uh, um, the, the waste as it is at the moment. What they're doing here is identifying the construction material potential of a particular site. So it's like a 3D map. So where it gets really tall and spiky is because there's a, a lot of stuff on that particular site. So this the stuff might can't be, you know, it might be a building or, or whatever, 
but, but the bottom line is if you or your client are working on any of these sites, Metabolic can give you the data that says this is the resource potential of that site for your project. And that might just say, well, I'm re, you know, reusing the whole building or there's a lot of other stuff lying around, whatever it is. But it's the sort of digital uh, you know, data, I mean, that we need to... Um, so there are these sorts of maps of uh, most European cities now, and it's this data we need to make this uh, reuse thing uh, uh, commonplace. This is uh, Dr. Elmer Demisevich from 4, uh, 4D Architects, and this is a rabbit bolt-on. So it's basically a, um, a bit of software that surveys a building and then digitally unpacks it. So it understands the modularity of the building. And breaks it down into its components. So you saw um, practice doing it. We're literally going there, surveying it by eye, and it does it for you. And it quantifies the type of elements, but it, it also has the ability to, to um, tell you if um, something's defective or not. So it identifies the waste element as well as the reuse element. So these things are actually happening. And a couple of years ago, 2019, just before um, the COVID lockdown, uh, the major infrastructure resource optimization group, MIROG, they presented a, a white paper presenting a case for a resource exchange mechanism, i.e. You know, a digital platform for people to swap stuff in the construction sector. It's happening with big contractors. They're doing it internally, but what we need is those big contractors to do it uh, with each other. And, you know, and the, the idea is, you know, the holy grail is if there's a is so there's a tower block in the city of London being deconstructed and another tower block quarter of a mile away being constructed. Wouldn't it be brilliant if the resource, you know, the resource from one in, um, supplied the other? So back to this idea of a circular economy in the two, the biosphere and the tech sphere. I just wanted to talk about one last project that we've we've worked on with Doug, and it's where we combine both the biosphere and the tech sphere. And um, uh, so I was just thinking I was going to say something else then, but I'll stick with this. So we were we were commit, um, uh, hired to design a new permanent building for Glyndebourne Opera House, which is on the South Downs, north of Lewis. And if you look on the right there, just by the big tree, there's a, a big wind turbine there. So uh, the client's committed to uh, decarbonisation of the site. And... Um, uh, at the moment, that wind turbine creates more electricity than the whole site requires, so that's good. But there's no getting away from it. This facility attracts a high carbon lifestyle. You know, you've got Prince Charles landing in a, a helicopter to go and see an opera sometime. And, and so, um, you know, there are um, contradictions. So we were asked to do the, uh, a building which was, in their terms, as, as green as possible. So we started with our normal resource maps. And so um, this is... Uh, obviously just, just off the South Downs. Well, it's within, yeah, it's within the National Park, actually. Um, and we were looking at resources. And number one is under-fired bricks. So we've got a, we've got a brickworks uh, within five miles of the site, Chaley Brickworks. And they, they create their bricks in a very traditional way. They make a, a basically a brick house out of bricks and they fire new bricks inside it. It's quite an inefficient system because they get a ton of, <laughs> or a load, of underfired bricks as well as overfired bricks as well as the bricks they want and those overfired and underfired bricks they normally just throw away they put back in the hole uh, which was made when they dug up the clay so we looked at those and we think we we can re we can use those so we can use the underfired bricks for petitions and we can use the overfired bricks as aggregates for screeds and tiles and stuff we've also got food waste on site we've got ash dye back on site um and we've got um uh, We've also got corks and glass um, from, uh, you know, of course, they, there's a lot of catering on site. So that's quite interesting. We've also got chalk on site. Even we've, there's a pile of chalk just from that wind turbine when they dug the foundations of that wind turbine. They have to dig up a lot of chalk. We've got that to use as well. And number five there uh, is mycelium. So we're working with a company called Biome who are developing an insulation product made out of mycelium, which is... Um, mushroom roots so this is the ash dieback now this is all across the southeast of the uk and beyond uh people are uh, chopping down ash trees because they've got this uh, horrible disease called ash dieback 
Um, and while we were developing the design of this building uh, at Glyndebourne, this is a photograph from site on Glyndebourne, uh, they were chopping down 400 uh, very mature ash trees. And you can see this is the timber drying at the moment there on the right. It's absolutely beautiful. And at the moment, most our ash dieback is being chipped for bio, biofuels, which is a disaster because it's absolutely gorgeous timber. Um, that's the chalk on site. We just did a test there. We've got a bore test um, of the chalk. Um, that's clay actually on the site uh, because it, we've got the, there's a, a lower bit to the site where the actual opera house is, and that's not chalk, that's clay. Um, we've also, as I said, we're harvesting corks um, from site. At the moment, their, their performances, the opera performances have a capacity of 50% capacity, which is 600 people. So the season's just finished, but they were doing three or four performances a week with, so again, about 2,400 people a week. So they were getting, they estimated they could collect 36,000 corks. Also, uh, these are the bottles we're actually collecting and we're using the glass as aggregates for screeds and tiles. So there's the burnt bricks there on the left, and that we're using those as aggregates for uh, floor and wall finishes. And here's a selection of the tiles and the screeds being made from uh, those aggregates plus, um, plus uh, chalk from the site. Now this is interesting because this is food waste. So these are different tile samples made out of food waste from the, in effect, the restaurant at Glyndebourne. So top left, you've got uh, orange peel and, uh, um, and coffee grounds. Um, and then the middle one, black one is just coffee grounds. And then the top right is grass. The one in the foreground is also grass. And the one in the, on the left there is a mixture of cork and coffee grounds. So this is working with biome again, and they bind it with a product they call Orm, which is, um, an organic product and these tiles are really tough and we're going to use them as wall tiles uh, in the pavilion itself. Uh, this is grass cuttings from site turned into uh, light fittings. And this is the mycelium insulation. Uh, and this insulation is really interesting because it's about to get a BVA certificate. We won't be using it if it doesn't get the BVA certificate, but biome are really interesting. They've only been going five years. They've got uh, factories set up in the West Country and one um, in uh, South London as well, their main uh, sort of laboratories in South London. And um, they, this material has the same R value resistance, thermal resistance, uh, as the Nostis PUR um, petroleum based plastic insulation out there. So it's a bit of a miracle, really. You know? So the other thing is, it doesn't burn it's got a lot better fire rating than the plastic insulation. But the most important thing is it got, it's got an end of life strategy. And that's really what this lecture is all about. What's your end of life strategy for the thing you're designing? What happens when it's not useful anymore? When it's not fit for purpose? How do you make it a resource nonetheless for your client? So this, at the end of its life, you put it in the ground and it's compost. It's got no additives at all to it. So uh, check out Biome. Sorry, my clicker's not working. That's just a drawing that shows where all the materials go uh, to create, that's the pavilion itself. There's a couple of images of it. It's a simple building. So the idea is actually that you know people who go there are some of the you know the, the big consumers on our planet, and maybe they'll be quite interested by the fact that the food waste from uh, uh, the restaurant on site actually helped create this building. So, in summary, we actually know what to do. So, what's stopping you right now? I don't deny there are challenges, but in my world, my point of view, there is a climate emergency, and we need to do something about it. Uh, stop treating sustainability as a Mickey Mouse issue. Uh, there's Bernard there from the World Bank. Uh, I've nicked this slide from him. Obviously, the economic uh, circle is normally the biggest one with the environment and social being uh, a second and third place. It, we need to be the environment first. It's our host planet. It's what we live on, and we're letting it burn at the moment. Uh, and don't forget, architecture can matter. This is a slide of the Karl Marx Hof 
built in the 1920s in Vienna for 1300 homeless families. It wasn't just housing, it's a urban forest, uh, forest school, dentists, doctors, shops in 1922. Yeah, it still exists. It's quite amazing. So our biggest challenge is not changing the way we practice today. Thank you very much. Keep well and safe. Cheers, Duncan. That's uh, absolutely fantastic. I was um, some of those case studies were were incredible, um, and as always, um, learned something about what you can do with grass cuttings that I <laughs> beyond putting them on the compost heap. And I guess that's the point, isn't it? It's um, it's just just learning about what what's going on out there. Um, we've got a load of um, a load of questions. We're a bit kind of tight on time, but let me pick out. Um, a few, as always, um, I mean, this is the whole point of mesh work, really. Do feel free to um, reach out to, uh, to to Duncan after this is over. Uh, but, but you know, fascinating, a fascinating subject. So let me just pull out a couple of questions here which stand out. Um, do, 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 do. So um, Nikki was first up. She asked about, um, she said particularly the... She was aware of that Paris apartment building that you were saying, yeah. about taking the facade out of and, and bolted on the um, the garden there. Um, but she was asking, how do you make how do you make the shift in imagination or, or perception happen? Is it is it via legislation or is it you know? I, I actually think it is. I think if you start if you'd started putting some pretty you might use the word what we feel like initially at first draconian laws, I think it's a tax thing. So instead, at the moment, we, I don't think it's sort of on purpose, but the moment, at the moment, we accidentally have tax laws that say, if you demolish, you're, we, we're going to support you. You could flip that on its head. And yeah. you could actually, you know, be with, you know, with the sort of work you and others do at Mesh, you can quantify the sort of whole carbon footprint of a thing, of a development. So if you can produce that evidence, you could get 0% VAT because you're you're meeting Letty's guidelines, for example, and you could just have a sliding sliding scale of VAT. So if you met building regulations, you'd pay VAT at 12% or something. But if you want to be zero VAT, then you have to go all the way. So it could easily be a sliding scale. I don't think it's that that's that uh, complicated. Um, so I think it needs to be legislation, tax incentive incentives, and you could be really strict on and be and charge a lot for creating waste on site. So if you're if you're um, if you're exporting stuff off site, it's going to cost you. And, and I think it sort of sort of does uh, with aggregates and things at the moment, you know, we, a lot of site where, where we've got better at, um, for example, at the moment for every, you know, I think it's between every seven and eight houses built now, one house worth of stuff goes to landfill. Mm. And the reason that's a lot better than it was by 50% is because people are crunching up concrete frames on site and using those aggregates for the next building on site. So exporting less but I, I'd spend a bit of time talking to demolition contractors and I can't exactly remember why but they said in the next couple of years that's not going to be uh, it's not going to be so expensive to export stuff off site again okay. um, which is unfortunate so I think we've got to be a bit draconian with um, yeah. with tax and other legislation okay. to encourage it it's just we've got to say this is the way we've got to do it we've got to you know you, you you'll you'll get benefits if you reuse if you import new stuff, it's got to be taxed. Yeah. Sorry, Nikki, just a quick extension to your question. You've got a, a few others to get through. Go for it. Yeah, sure. I'll be really quick. Um, so I've got, I've possibly got COVID, so I'm not feeling brilliant. I'm wrapped up on the sofa. Um, also, Duncan, do you think that we need to reach out to the construction industry, you know, at the lower levels as well for education? Because, you know, I've worked in renewable heating and everyone just chucks things in the skip. It's, it's second nature. So there needs to be... Um, you know that side of the the supply chain, if you like, needs to um, to know all this because I think at the moment they really don't. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree. I mean, that's why I do. I attend any talk and debate I can at the moment, and I. Um, but I, I again, I think if, um, like I said, if you uh, put uh, if you taxed uh, skips more often, that's going to hit everybody. So you're going to have to think about doing things in a different way. I think in, we need we need you know carrot and stick. So I think if, I'm not sure the government knows what to do. I'm I am encouraged though, that local authorities know what to do. 
I'm involved with a lot of different projects with local uh, with local authorities at a strategic level, and there's a lot of knowledge there. I find I'm really um, enthused by that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm conscious we haven't got a lot of time, and maybe. No, I mean, uh, that's interesting. It's, it, there's great news that you, you, you're seeing that kind of positive feedback. I, I, I was just going to ask Glenn's question. Actually, he was asking about: Do you find it difficult at times to convince clients to take these alternative approaches? Um, and would you have any advice for strategies on how to do it? So if you've got, you know, you, you've, you've got other people that, that get what you're saying, how do yeah. you start broaching this with their clients uh, and, and, and kind of give them confidence? It, it's the kind okay, of- Okay, I do, I, I, there's a disclaimer. It is difficult to do this, okay? <laughs> building regulations are nowhere. You'd like building regulations to be something that would support this point of view. They do not do that at the moment, okay? Mm. However, the narrative that I present to clients is there is in the informed part of the construction sector a narrative, uh, sorry, a, a consensus for a, a whole laugh, a whole carbon descent mm. plan. Everybody, everybody thinks they understand about net zero carbon. They know that the local authorities and central government have commitments to that. So you start with that and just say to meet that, this is what you need to do. And it's the way it's the way of doing it. I mean, the, I, what I find is more and more clients are wanting to know. I mean, between, you know, big. If you're thinking that, uh, yeah, big uh, financial institutions are looking very carefully at this because their insurers are the ones who are feeling the heat from bushfires and floods at the moment. I mean, yeah, we, we, you know, can you imagine if just those areas in in central Europe, Germany, that have been flooded in the last six months? How are you ever going to get insurance again? to build anything there where are those people going to live that's the everyday now so it's uh, one of the most powerful uh, talks that i went to a couple of years ago at the science museum which was by a couple of lloyd's underwriters who were saying if you if you take the insurance element out of a construction project it's not going to happen so if you can't get insurance for it so i think it's it's the sort of thing that's going to flip really quickly maybe very soon i would would have thought very soon so i think you present it to your clients as this it's going to save them money in the end and yeah, the other and thing then, i would then, say sometimes don't make such a big deal out of it just get on with it just empower yourself with the knowledge and just do it so sometimes you can make a big big deal out of something but and i tend to make a big deal out of something just to communicate it but sometimes our clients aren't knowing so much about i mean one thing we used to do all the time is just use natural materials for for insulation and then some clients have just never told them that's what it was it, you know <laughs> it was it it, it was the easy devil you don't know yeah. well in a way yeah yeah I, and, and you know there, there's been a couple of mentions here you know gavin was talking about how does this become mainstream you've got uh, marta asking about um or just just making it crystal clear that, you know, um, as you mentioned with insurance companies and fire risk and, and British stand, you just can't get anywhere without winning over the insurance companies. And, and so it's just a, it, it sounds like we're at the, at the start, sadly, but I mean, at least we're at the start of a, of a, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of virtuous cycle where tools become available, people start listening more, policy starts changing. Then, then more people get involved and more people understand it and more yeah. these maps are available. Um, but great, I mean, loads and loads and loads of questions. Sadly, we haven't got time to, to go through it, but I would encourage you to um, to, to reach out, keep discussing it and, and watch this presentation again. I mean, as I say, we're recording it. There's loads of information that Duncan presented there. Um, so a massive thank you, Duncan, for your uh, for your time. Um, my, head's, my head's buzzing and uh, hopefully lots and lots of people watch this video after we've uh, after we've finished here um just by way of a kind of a quick wrap up and, and talking about next week um what i didn't mention if you've jumped on this uh webinar after uh we we started um although the, we've been doing these on wednesdays we've got more and more speakers involved so we're going to start doing these on mondays and tuesdays and it varies week on week our next one um is on Tuesday of next week and that's with Darren Bray and a great follow-on from um, Duncan's here because it's about retrofit and about community engagement. Darren gets involved in a lot of community projects uh, with great success uh, and, and so do drop on to that one to, to again find out if you're interested in repurposing buildings, how to talk to the wider stakeholders uh, and, and what success looks like from Darren Bray's point of view uh, and again huge amount of uh, information and knowledge and, and Darren himself much like Duncan um, is a lecturer so so great at getting the information across 
for now, we're going to wrap that up. A huge, huge thank you, Duncan, for your for your time there um, and, and presentation. Um, as I say, guys, keep asking your questions. Thanks very much for uh, joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye.